the average person that's moving through their human incarnation is laden with a tremendous amount of fear, a lot of worry, a lot of doubt. Humanity suffers from an inability to see reality. They're basically living in a cesspool of a, a projection of separation, not enoughness, fear, lack, scarcity. All of these form a perception for the average person to walk around with a sense of anxiousness. And that's how many people are living their lives today. They're governed by the corporate media. They have a, what I call a, an intention deficit disorder. They have no real underlying intention for their lives because their intention has been hijacked by the world. So there's a big issue. And that issue is that people are in fear and worry and uh, they're always on the edge of survival. And that generates a whole lot of toxic chemicals in the body temple. It ages a person prematurely. It blocks their creativity. It blocks critical thinking. It blocks the ability to have really long-lasting and, and satisfying relationships. It blocks uh, getting up in the morning and being pulled by a tremendous vision of how they can live their life. And so we want to begin to open up people to the realization that the universe is on their side. The universe is friendly. The universe wants to become conscious of itself as every being on this planet. When I speak of the universe, I'm speaking about the outpicturing of the mind of the infinite. And it never works against itself, it never contradicts itself, it never compromises itself, it is lawful, and it is for us. Now imagine individuals waking up every day with the awareness that the entire universe is on your side, that all of this presence that is never an absence, is on your side, an individual will begin to walk a little differently. They begin to perceive life a little differently. The individual begin to think a little differently. Now, when I think about myself, I can remember being the kind of individual I've just described, an individual that had a, a certain level of fear and worry and wonder about my future. So there was, a, there was a time in my life where I was a part of this radical group. We really wanted to change the country for the better by any means necessary. And I can remember being in a meeting and as the meeting was progressing, I heard this voice say, if you were to take over the world tomorrow, would the world be any different? So I turned around to see who had said it, but there was no one there. So we continued with the meeting. I heard it again. If you were to take over the world tomorrow, would the world be any different? And I realized that voice was coming from within me. And so I looked around the room and I saw who was in the meeting with me. And I could see the individuals that were sitting there, their particular issues. I could see all of the issues that they were working, working out. And I realized that the world would not be any different. It would be the same world we're living in now because these individuals had not really dealt with their fears, worries, and sense of separation. So I left that meeting and I never returned. The very next week, someone in that meeting shot somebody in that meeting. Someone got so heated about something that they pulled out a gun and shot someone. But fortunately for me, I was not there to be a part of that whole illegal scene. So now here I was, didn't know what to do with my life. And so after a while, I enrolled in college. I'd attended Morehouse College. I enrolled in USC. I was a psychobiology major going through med school. But I didn't really have a real full-on vision. And I was smoking a lot of marijuana at the time. And I began to sell it to my friends, and then that little selling it to my friends became a really nice cottage industry. My entrepreneurial skills kicked in. I had uh, individuals in Atlanta, Nashville, New York, DC, Los Angeles. It was a, a rather large business. Interestingly enough, there was a period of time where I realized this was not my life. Even though I was paying cash money to USC, I was attending school, paying cash money for my tuition. I had a lot of money, but I was empty inside. And I realized this was not me. And I'd begun having these spiritual experiences. And I stopped smoking weed. The spiritual experiences continue. And on my very last dope deal, I got busted by the police. When I met with this man, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. This is my last deal. And he said, why? We're making such good money. You're so honest. This is such a beautiful relationship. <laughs> and I said, this is not me. This is not who I am. And all of a sudden, I felt something just move in the force, so to speak. And I said, we have to leave right now. And uh, subsequently, I was pushed off the street by the police. They searched my car. They didn't find anything because I, I had the uh, marijuana in the house. And anyway, I, w I was arrested. And I started to go to court. I'm going to tell you two stories just so you know who I am. I had begun to have this spiritual awakening. And the spiritual awakening 
had lasted and was lasting for approximately a year. And I had a series of dreams, visions, and to make a long story short, I was killed in a lucid dream, stabbed in the heart. When I woke up, I could see that I was surrounded by a presence of love and beauty, that everything was shimmering and glowing with a, a luminosity, a brilliance, a light. I felt so taken care of by this presence, so taken care of by the universe, so taken care of by God, if I could use that, that word, even though I didn't use that word at the time. And so I was told that I would walk free from this particular legal issue. People thought I had lost my mind. And I said, no, I was told I'm walking free from this. And they said, you know, you should, you should leave the country because once you're prosecuted for the large amount of marijuana, there were also guns in the house and things of that particular nature. It was a federal case. And I said, no, I'm not going to have a record at all. People really thought I lost my mind, but I was connected. So I'm in court and um, my attorneys are interviewing a police officer. They say, well, why did you go to this man's house? And they said, we were informed by an informant that a large dope deal was going on. So we staked out the house. We got a search warrant. And when the deal was made, we rushed in and arrested him. Now, a side note of that, none of that ever happened. The police lied, but that's not really what the story's about. So my attorney stood up and said, that's hearsay evidence. We demand that the informant come and stand before the accused. If not, we want this thrown out. So the judge initiated a recess for three days until they could find the informant. He said, Mr. Beckwith, you're going to come back in three days. I came back in three days, and the judge said, Mr. Beckwith, the informant refuses to come forward. I have no other recourse but to set you free. I hope I never see you in my courtroom again. I said, Your Honor, you'll never see me again. I walked out. I went home. The wind was blowing very fiercely. And I looked up at this weather vane that was pointed, of course, in the direction that the wind was blowing. And I said to myself, to this presence that I was so becoming more and more familiar with. If this is really true, if this is all what I think it means for my life, I would like that weather vane to point in my direction against the wind. And before I could get the words out of my mouth, while I was yet thinking it, the weather vane turned and pointed right at me. And I started crying. And I, and I surrendered myself to the excellence and the love and the beauty and the joy and the abundance that I felt when my heart cracked open and I could see that we were surrounded by a presence that's never an absence. It was so real. Thus began my conscious foray into the arena of spirituality, in the arena of expanded awareness, affirmative prayer, meditation, life visioning emerged, all, all of that. So my background is real. I've been through like real experiences, had real openings, real insights, and then a powerful demonstration within the legal system of me walking away without any record whatsoever based on my connection with this dynamic presence. So I'm keenly aware that the universe is friendly. And as I indicated earlier, the universe is the outpicturing of the mind of the universal presence. It's the physical manifestation of an order, a harmony, a symmetry, an elegance that never compromises itself. And so I think this is very important because there are people walking on the planet right now. As I said earlier, people are suffering from an inability to see reality. They actually think that the universe is against them, that it's unfriendly, that there's chaos, that things just happen in the world, and we don't know what's going to happen next, and this type of thing. But we know now, at this particular age, even in the quantum chaos theory, that if you can look at anything in the world that looks chaotic, if you stand back far enough, you'll see that there's an underlying order that's actually trying to emerge via what seems to be the chaos. So the universe is extremely friendly, and it wants to become conscious of itself as our very life. And so subsequently, in my development over a number of years, I have embraced four stages of spiritual growth development and unfoldment as a way to describe who we are, way to describe what the universe is up to where we are concerned, and a way to describe how we can participate in our own unfolding. Now, what I just said there is very important because we are here to actually participate in our own evolution, our own prosperity, our own wonderful relations, our own health. It doesn't just happen. It happens just. And so the four stages goes like this. 
It's uh, to us, by us, through us, and as us. That's in brief. I'll break it down to you. Stage one is the stage of the victim. Individual who is living in victim consciousness has the tendency to think that there is something outside of themselves that's determining their happiness, their joy, and their success. So they're actually living in the world thinking that something is doing something to them. God is doing something to me. The devil is doing something to me. The stars, my astrological chart, my numbers. I'm a victim to circumstance. I'm a victim to my DNA. I'm a victim to my heredity. I'm a victim to something outside. And there are millions of people, or probably billions of people, who are actually living in that particular state of consciousness where they think something is doing something to them. And uh, this is the stage that the actuary columns of an insurance company, they actually make their money from people living in victim consciousness with statistics. So many people are going to have an accident. So many people are going to catch cancer. So many people are going to lose their jobs, this type of thing. And people become receptive to that kind of malicious hypnotism. So that's stage one, victim. Stage two is called the manifestor stage. And here is where we begin to learn that there are actually universal laws, mental and spiritual laws that govern our life experience. Just as there are physical laws called gravity, uh, electricity, laws that state that water boils when it gets to a certain level of heat. There are laws that say that your thought, which is a unit of mental energy, has the tendency to transmute itself into your perception and your experience. We call that the law of mind in action. There are universal laws. In stage two, the manifestor level, you're actually learning what these laws are. You're actually beginning to apply them. Individuals can actually begin to think about themselves. Do they have best case scenarios in their life? Or do you have a worst case scenario in your life? In other words, when something happens in your life, do you immediately go to, oh my God, this terrible thing happened. This means that I'm going to get fired and I'm going to be homeless and then I'm going to die. They're actually using the laws negatively. They're actually using their thoughts by creating a worst case scenario. And uh, what I teach is best case scenarios. When something comes up, you begin to imagine, what if this is the best thing that ever happened to me? What if talents and gifts begin to open up in me? What if the universe is providing another door for me when another one appears to be open? You begin to imagine best case scenarios and then what happens? Those thoughts begin to be transmuted into perception and our perception governs our experience. So in stage two, we learn the art of creative imagination. We learn the art of visualization. We learn the art of declaration and decree. We learn the art of affirmation. We learn the art of describing the kind of life we want to live in. As I teach, you do not describe what you see. You see what you describe. That is a law. You don't describe what you see. You're actually seeing what you have been describing. If you built your life on worst case scenarios, fear, doubt, worry, and you describe life is hard until you die, you will eventually see that. So you end up seeing your description of life. So in stage two, we actually open up people to begin to forge a new description. The universe is friendly. The universe is for me. Everything I can want, hope for, and desire, I already have it within me. I just need to unleash it. We begin to monitor our conversation. We begin to speech. We begin to see life differently. We begin to look for possibilities. We end up seeing what we're looking for because we're generating it from within our own being. This is all powerful stage two manifester level consciousness. And you cannot transcend anything that you have not mastered. So we master this stage. We actually have exercises where even as I'm speaking to all of you now, begin to take a breath and, and begin to imagine the kind of life you want to live. You know, begin to imagine. You know, when you break down the word imagine, what does it say? I am a genie. <laughs> you begin to imagine what it would feel like to be totally healthy. What, do, what would it feel like to have all of my needs met? What would it feel like to be totally loved and supported by my friends and associates? What would it feel like to feel a deep sense of confidence in myself? What would it feel like 
to be in my light, right livelihood. Uh, you know, you begin to use your imagination that way. So as I'm speaking, I want everyone just to begin to feel that now. Just take a, an area of your life, physical health, emotional health, finances, relations, and just see what you want to experience. Begin to just close your eyes for just a second and just begin to imagine total health. Begin to imagine wealth and well-being. Begin to imagine creativity. How does that feel? How does that feel? Now, it doesn't mean a thing until you have the feeling. Until you have the feeling. And so this is really good stage two work. You're mastering the art of having dominion over your attention so that the world can't hijack it. Now, what do I mean by that? You wake up, corporate news media is beating on your door to tell you about the latest flu, the latest virus, the latest violence, the latest negativity, the worst case scenarios of the human condition. It beats in upon the door of your mind to bring all of this negativity to you. If you don't protect your consciousness, you'll be hijacked and you'll actually see the world that way. In reality, out of the 7.2 billion people on the planet, most people are not waking up and going to bed wanting to kill people, wanting to steal. Most people go to bed every day wanting safety for their family, wanting food, shelter, education, and good health care. That's the majority of people on the planet. Our mind is hijacked by a very small minority, you see. So what we're doing is taking our mind back. We learn in stage two that the mind is a set of programs that I'll picture as our experience. And so many people have been programmed into fear, doubt, worry, lack, limitation, scarcity, not enoughness, and separation. We reprogram the mind through stage two so that the mind becomes an opening for possibility, opening for availability, opening for more good than we could ultimately possibly imagine. That's stage two. It's a good segue into stage three, because stage three, we are a channel, and it's beyond, we're living now beyond the imaginal realm. Stage two, if you can conceive it, you can achieve it. Stage three, it's beyond your imagination. Stage two, you have to imagine it. Stage three, you have to surrender to it. In other words, stage two, you make it happen with your mind. Stage three, you make it welcome. All of the work that you have done in stage two, let you know that you're living in a friendly universe, it's lawful, there's nothing against you, you're always experiencing your own perception about life, so therefore you can actually begin to release and let go. You can actually begin to allow. Words like allowing, yielding, surrender, letting, these words come back into play, but we know now we're not surrendering to an external deity that is checking the list twice to seeing if you're naughty or nice. <laughs> We've learned that the universe is friendly and that as the old statement goes, God made us in its image and we've been trying to return the favor ever since. So people have been projecting onto this God all of these human foibles, all of the fears and the doubts and the God that many people worship is a God that needs anger management. I'm going to smite you and zelt jealous and I'm going to get you and I have chosen people and I'm going to send you to hell. Now that's a God that needs therapy. <laughs> and so when we really learn these laws of, of the universe, we realize there's no such God like that. I call it the presence. It's never an absence and it never changes up on itself. It is total love. When I had that awakening and I, can, and I had many more for many years, this presence is total love, total peace, total consciousness, total life, never changes up on itself at all. And so when we move into stage three, we begin to ask questions. Stage three is where the vision process is. Stage two is where visualization is. You cut your teeth, you begin your metaphysical walk with visualization, and then you slowly graduate to life visioning. Life visioning, you ask questions. Now this is a very important teaching here. The average person asks disempowering questions. What's wrong? Why me? Who's to blame? Those are disempowering questions. But people ask them over and over again. What's wrong? Who's to blame? Why is this happening to me again? 
we have to ask empowering questions, questions that empower us. Because the universe, now check this out, the universe is friendly, but it will answer every question that you ask. So if you ask a disempowering question, it will answer. It will pull from the database of human consciousness and begin to give you all kinds of excuses as to why your life isn't the way it is meant to be. You know, you had a bad childhood. Uh, this happened. That happened. No one likes you. Whatever the case may be. But if you ask an empowering question, the universe will answer that question as well. This is how I've taught it over the years. Behind every problem, there is a question trying to ask itself. Behind every question, there's an answer trying to reveal itself. Behind every answer, there is an action trying to be taken. And behind every action, there's a way of life trying to be born. So behind every problem, there's a question. Behind every question, there's an answer. Behind every answer, there's an action. Behind every action, there's a way of life. So when we begin to ask an empowering question, the universe answers it for us. In life visioning, stage three, we actually ask, what is my purpose? We actually ask, what is the universe up to with my life? How does the universe want to show up in my life? What is the vision that is intrinsic to my nature? And I begin to teach people how to ask empowering questions, how to move into a greater state of embodiment, how to let go of that which no longer serves us, how to embrace the resources we already have, and to move into the dynamic sacred yes that allows for the answers to flow and for great manifestation beyond our imagination to take place. Stage two, you use your imagination. Stage three, you go beyond your imagination into a greater expression of reality that we're just barely beginning to see. So stage four, being as us. What I have seen over and over and over again, that when the lines of separation dissolve, the life, it doesn't matter what you call this life. You can call it life. You can call it consciousness. I used to call it love, beauty, love, beauty, intelligence. You can call it God, as long as you don't think it's a man in the sky. The lines of separation dissolve, and you realize that the only life that there is, is this one life. And it's a universal life. And the universal life is individualizing itself you, and you are universalizing. The universal is individualizing, and the individual is universally if I could make up that word. And so we are all individualized expressions of the one life. And so when we go through the four stages, you actually, to move out of stage one, you actually identify your victim story, your blame story, and you move into active forgiveness so that you can actually take responsibility for your life. In stage two, you learn to take responsibility for your life. You start to use your imagination for the right purpose. And then as you start to move into stage three, you're giving up control. That's done incrementally, little by little, with every demonstration, every miracle that you see. You start to release yourself to a greater sense of surrender. And then in stage three, you're living in the zone. Stage three is, is zone and flow. You're not thinking. Something just takes you over. Everyone has seen a great orator. They've seen a great athlete. They've seen, I've seen a, a great surgeon that gets taken over and beyond their imagination and beyond their planning, something takes them over and they look back on it and it felt like only five minutes. What happened? Something took me over. That's stage three. When you give up control, little by little, you move more and more into the zone or into the flow. And then to move into stage four, little by little by little, we give up a sense of separation from life. No more am I looking outside for love and beauty and God and joy. I realize it's here, it's closer. It's closer than my breathing. It's nearer than my hands and feet. Now these things don't just happen overnight. It's a part of a practice. And then that's why we're offering this extended class. So people can actually get the tools, the knowledge in order to embrace their own unfolding. And at the same time, begin to live the life that they're destined to live. Now, why do I say that? There's a life, some people say, use the word should, there's a life you should live. I say, there's a life we are meant to live. Not should, should comes from the external. You know, you should go to school. You should be a doctor. You should marry that person. 
And sometimes it comes from parental fantasies or societal, societal fantasies about our life. But there is a life that we're meant to live, just as there's a, a rose bush within every seed, every rose bush seed. The rose bush is not living from, well, I should be a rose. No, it's living from, I'm meant to be a rose bush, you see. Now, all of us have something within us that is unique to us, yet it is universal at the same time. It is individual and universal, which means we carry the whole template of the universe within us. And it is unique. There's only one of us. And so with these practices that we're going to go into, particularly in the longer version of the class, these practices actually create the condition for what we're meant to be to emerge. Those are very powerful words I use, meant to be and emerge. In other words, we're not making something happen. We're creating a condition for that which is intrinsic to us to emerge. And within the avocado tree, within the avocado seed is an avocado tree. It's intrinsic. It, it will emerge if the condition is right. Within the rose bush seed, intrinsic to that seed is a rose bush. When the condition is right, the rose bush emerges. The seed doesn't make it happen. The right condition makes it welcome. And so when individuals begin to embrace the great understanding of the right use of visualization and then segue into the vision process of asking the right questions, they are creating the proper conditions for the emergence of their giftedness, their talent, their skills, and the way that the universe wants to individualize itself according to each person's uniqueness. This is powerful. You realize that you do not have to be a victim of circumstance. You do not have to be a victim to your so-called past. You do not have to be a victim to parental fantasies. You do not have to be a victim to how you were raised. You do not have to be a victim uh, to the society in which you are living. You are an individualized expression of the only life that there is. And this life wants to express through you. The universe, the friendly universe is playing tag. You're it. It's tagging you and saying, go forth and express me. I've given you everything. Everything you need is within you. Now you have to discover it. You have to activate it. And you have to express it. And then what we will do, we will take on our, what I call the different life structures we will begin to take on our spiritual structure. We're all spiritual beings. What does that mean? I'm not talking religion. I'm not talking religiosity. Spiritual means eternal, forever. We are all beings that have never been born and will never die. That's our spiritual nature. Our spiritual nature contains love, intelligence, beauty, plentitude, abundance. And as we begin to understand that through the right understanding of spiritual technology, of life visioning, of prayer, of, of meditation. We come to an awareness that we're not just the body temple, that we own a body temple. We have one on lease, but we are spiritual beings first and foremost. The daily practice is extremely important. And it's not just the practice makes perfect. It's the practice of perfection that makes perfect. Because people do have a practice, but most people have a practice of negativity. They have a practice of fear. They have a practice of one-upsmanship. They have a practice of putting other people down. They have a practice of living in a fear-based universe. So what we're talking about here is cultivating a spiritual practice of perfection, and not perfectionism, a spiritual practice in which we're seeing the universe as friendly. We're seeing ourselves connected. We're seeing and feeling that our intrinsic nature is whole and complete and perfect and magnificent and brilliant. We're developing that kind of practice so that we're loosing ourselves from being a victim of time and space and circumstance. We begin to break free and that powerful rose that's within you will emerge. That powerful dynamic being that's within us all will emerge. And so what I like to do is to bring people to an understanding that we live in certain structures and that our spiritual practice is basically what I call stabilize the structures so that we can go deeper. It's not that we stabilize the structures and then that's it. The stabilized structure simply means you have a platform to go beyond your imagination, to go beyond your limited point of view of who you are. So you're always unfolding, you're always growing, you're always evolving. So your life is an adventure. 
It's not a survival kit where you're just trying to survive day to day. You're actually on an adventure and exploration into abundance and love and beauty and joy and health and harmony, and it keeps going. So as I mentioned, one of the structures is spiritual, not religion. We separate uh, religiosity from spirituality. Spirituality means I come to know myself as a spiritual being, as a being that is eternal, a being that did not begin with me being born in my mother's womb, but I've always been and I'll always be. And intrinsic to my spiritual nature are the qualities of love, the qualities of life, intelligence, beauty, peace. These are all qualities that are all within us. They're not external. Our spiritual practices of life visioning, of meditation, of affirmative of prayer brings us into that realization. We begin to have an, a greater understanding of the ego, of our ego, so that we have a healthy ego. We understand that the ego from an evolutionary context uh, helped us see division and helped us see separation so, so the human race could survive. We could tell the difference between us and a saber-toothed tiger, the difference between us and another tribe during the time of tribalism. Now we have to transcend the ego's bounds so that we don't feel a sense of separation from the world, our oceans, our environment, other people, other people with different color skins, different nationalities, different ethnicities, different sexual orientations. So we develop a healthy ego, which means we're not trying to be better than anyone, nor are we trying to be worse than anyone, nor are we trying to be equal with anyone. We realize that we are unique expressions of this infinite presence. So it's not better than, it's not less than, and it's not equality. We're all unique in this magnificent ocean of devotion this ocean of presence that is closer to us than the air we're breathing right now. And then another structure is livelihood, the way that we share our creativity and our giftedness uh, for prosperity. We set up through the vision process a way to tap into what is our real livelihood. I mean, obviously, some of the great centers in basketball are not going to be jockeys on a horse. And obviously, there are ways by which we are to express our particular livelihood, our particular gifted nature, and we can discover what our right livelihood is. There aren't any extra people on the planet. The universe didn't make a mistake and say, oh, I made too many people. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a reason to live and to express. Everyone has gifts. Everyone has talents. Everyone has a dynamic purpose. Everyone is an on purpose with a purpose. And then the structure of our relationships. Our relations become a ship, a way which we transform our interior awareness of any sense of separation, any sense of self-loathing, self-denial, uh, self-worth. We begin to work on those particular areas so that our relations become a good reflection of who we know ourselves to be. So that we work on ourselves to such a degree that we love who we are. We love what the universe has made as us. We learn how to treat ourselves well so that our relationships begin to be a really good reflection of that. So that we have meaningful friendships, collegial relationships with people in our place of employment, a significant relationships with a lover, friend. All of our relationships begin to be a place where what? we explore deeper dimensions of love. We don't try to get love from a relationship, but we learn to bring love to our relationships. That's empowerment. The average person is trying to get love from somebody. When you become empowered, you actually bring love to your friendships, to your relationships, and you begin to heal the parental fantasies that has brought a lot of pain in terms of the family of origin dynamics. Now, we've covered four structures. One is spirituality. You're having a greater awareness of who you are as a spiritual being. I want you to begin to think about and rate yourself in that area uh, from a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of your understanding and in terms of your embodiment of who you think you are as a spiritual being. Some people will be down at the, the level of one. They don't even see themselves as a spiritual being. Others see themselves as a very a dynamic spiritual being. Just begin to rate yourself. And this rating is not judgmental, it's not to induce guilt, just awareness. Awareness allows growth to happen. So I want you to rate yourself in the area of spirituality, not religiosity, but how you see yourself as a spiritual being. Do you see yourself connected to the great universal presence that's never an absence? Are you beginning to see yourself as a being that has been born and will never die? are beginning to feel the qualities of being a spiritual being with love, 
and peace and joy and harmony. Begin to rate yourself in terms of ego. Are you living in this world trying to be better than others? Are you living in this world with a level of inferiority? Or are you trying to be equal? At some point, you begin to understand that as the ego becomes very healthy, you realize you are a unique expression of infinite possibility and that you have what is called a healthy ego. What number pops up when we think about where your ego is in terms of that particular structure? Think about livelihood. Are you in your ideal place of employment right now? Are you utilizing your skills and your talents? Yes or no? Feel into that and rate yourself. Think about your relationships, not just your primary relationship or love relationship. Think about your relationships. Is there a level of harmony, a level of order, a level of love, level of trust, level of happiness? Where are you in a scale of one to 10 where your relationships are? Think about that for a second. And then consider the other structure, body temple. You own a body. You have a body. You're not your body, but you have a body. You are to be the steward of the body temple. Do you take care of it? Are you feeding it proper nutrition? Are you exercising it? Are you resting it? Is the body temple healthy or is it unstable? Meaning you always have to go to the doctor. You're always sick. You're always catching the flu, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One to 10, where are you where the body temple is concerned? Now, finances, prosperity, it's sometimes with livelihood, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes we can separate those two. How are you with your finances right now? Now, remember, this is not judgment. This is not beating yourself up. It's just an awareness exercise so that you can be available to more financial prosperity in your life. Because if you have the money that you need, when you need it, you're not worried about it. You can be more creative. You can go for your dreams. You can go for your vision because you're not just working for money. Where are you on a scale of one to 10? The next one is called beliefs. Now this one, we're gonna go really deeply in the class because when we talk about beliefs, we're talking about our religious beliefs and they coherent with reality. And oftentimes people have inherited beliefs that they've never examined. They just believe it because their parents had that belief. They're in a political party because their parents had, had that particular belief. We want to discover, do we really know what we believe? What is the baseline of our beliefs? Because if we do not have an understanding, we can become fundamentalists where our beliefs are concerned, or when somebody challenges our belief, we feel that they're challenging us. So in terms of your understanding of your own belief system, where are you from one to 10? And then the last one is community. Community is where we give our service. We all live in a community, a world global community, a neighborhood, a city, a state, and we are to be transformational agents in our community. On a scale of one to 10, are you involved in terms of bringing your gifts, talents, and capacities in service to the world community? Again, these kind of bleed together a little bit. As we go into the class deeper, we will flesh them out, we will understand them, and we will also learn to stabilize ourselves in these eight structures as a launching pad to a greater expression of life and living. Those are the eight structures. You might be in one part of your life, you may be in the flow, in the zone. You don't even think about it because you have so much excellence in that area. Another area of your life, you may be living under the context of being a victim. And so these stages and these structures are not linear. They're dynamic and they're always changing. The idea is to have them stabilized through spiritual practice so they do not encumber us. This is what stabilization means. Stabilization means that you've leveraged enough energy that those areas of your life are assets rather than liabilities. So when you look at the body temple, the body temple is healthy enough, so it's not a liability, it's an asset. Your financial life is not a liability, it's an asset. Your relationships are not liability, you don't argue with people all the time, you can't stay in a healthy relationship because of some unhealed issues, it's an asset. You know how to get along with people, you know how to speak to people directly, you know how to receive and give love. So these areas, which are not linear, you're always growing in those areas, become stabilized, and you go to higher and higher levels of them. So no, it's not crazy if you have numbers all over the place, it's really quite normal. And as I said earlier, it's not to be used for judgment or blame or shame, just awareness. With awareness, we make new choices and we grow. We become available and we grow. I encourage to have a spiritual practice of one meditation, affirmative prayer, 
and to engage into the life visioning process on a regular basis. Of course, we always have the stage two technologies of the right use of creative imagination and visualization and right speech. The way we see the universe and the way we see the presence is how we pray. And so if we see the presence as outside of ourselves, we'll beseech and beg. But if we understand that the presence is omni, it's omnipresent, it's everywhere, we don't beg or beseech. We commune. And we speak from that communion. And it's a whole different kind of prayer. It's the evolution of prayer from trying to get God to give us something to actually working on ourselves to have a realization that we already have it. And so I invite everyone to place their feet firmly on the ground, have their back straight without being rigid. And if you'll just close your eyes for a moment, Begin to be aware that, that this moment is the most important moment. Not where we're going after this moment, not where we have come from, but this moment. And embrace the intention that we're sitting here for a, a moment of silence, simply to wake up to our great potential. To wake up to who we really are as a spiritual being to wake up to who we really are as a being of dynamic health and well-being and dynamic connectedness to the universe. Feel that as an intention. Just allow yourself to amplify that in intention to wake up to this truth. Place the attention on the breath. That breath is happening presently. The body is breathing presently. As your attention is on the breath, you'll notice that you're not in the future, nor are you in the past. You are present right now and becoming a candidate for coming into the holy instant where eternity breaks into time. Allow yourself to be still the intention is to wake up. The attention is on our intention simultaneously. It's on our breath. Be still for just a few seconds. And with our awareness on the breath and our ever-expanding awareness that we're surrounded by a pool of love, a field of love, a field of safety and well-being. It is my privilege and my honor to move us through the state of gratitude right now. Allow yourself to feel so grateful for something, so thankful for your life. Gratitude cleanses the perceptual windows that we're able to see that life is for us and never against us. We move into the state of gratitude right now. And from this state of gratitude, there is a, a recognition that life is for us and that this life is everywhere being itself. From this sense of a recognition, there's a, a feeling tone of unification. We're unifying with this grand presence that we're now seeing through the windows of gratitude. No separation, no otherness, no other power, no other place. All here now. From this sense of unification, I have the privilege of speaking the word for each and every being listening right now. Knowing that where they are, the full presence is, and that there's nothing lacking in their life. I get to speak the word right now, knowing that this word is a law of elimination that eliminates anything that would hinder, delay, obstruct, or deny the fullness of life from expressing through these beings right now is dynamic health, dynamic well-being, dynamic uh, happiness and joy. And that every organ, action, and function of the body temple is made every whit whole. I speak the word for every being listening now. Knowing that something wonderful is occurring. Something magnificent is, uh, is on the verge uh, of unfolding in their life right now. I feel it in my bones. And so as we have a level of coherence around 
a deep and an abiding intention to be our greater self. As we have a level of uh, attentiveness, we're right here in present moment, not in the future. As we have a level of availability, the word that I'm speaking activates our deepest potential, the next stage of our unfolding and sets ourselves free. I speak the word that we feel that all of our needs are met right now on every level of our existence and that from this moment on, everything is working together for our individual and for our collective good. I feel it. I evoke it. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. And for this and more than words could ever say, I give great thanks. And I let it be now and forever. And so it is. Now, so be it. Amen. So as we slowly open our eyes with a feeling tone, slowly open our eyes with a feeling tone that all of our needs are met, that everything is working together for our good, we hold that space and we move in the world with that feeling and the universe responds to us like a vibrational signature. A, we're releasing a signal that that's who we are and the universe responds to us. The word realization is very important. It's not something that we make up in our mind. We're actually having an expanded awareness of our divine purpose. Each individual is an on purpose with a purpose with intrinsic expression of love and beauty and peace and joy and harmony and prosperity as only they can express it. Now, bliss and extreme happiness and joy is a function of us discovering our purpose and expressing it. There are individuals that have counterfeit happiness. That is, their happiness is based on external things that they have achieved, but it is sleety, it's flighty, it comes and goes. When you're living your divine purpose, you're talking about a permanent joy, a permanent happiness, not something that comes and goes. And most people, as I indicated earlier, their minds have been hijacked by parental or societal fantasies of happiness. But there is a purpose within us, and that purpose is to reflect and to reveal the cosmos as only we can do it. And so with spiritual technology and pure intentionality, we awaken to our purpose and we express it, and then all of the things of the world we get to have as well. Good health, prosperity, right relationships, but it is from the essence of our soul. We don't make it happen, we let it happen. It's all within us. The essence of the visioning process allows us to catch the vision, learn to articulate it, learn to take the steps necessary to create the condition for its unfoldment, and then to live it fully. And this is the beautiful thing about it. You don't have to have an extremely high IQ to do it. You have to have an AQ. An AQ is an availability quotient. I am going to help people master and magnify their availability quotient. So it doesn't matter whether they've gone to school or not gone to school or whatever. Everyone has equal access to their own divine purpose. Now, what I teach is that there are task-oriented people, goal-oriented people, and purpose-oriented people. People that have tasks, they have no goals. They're just drawing lines in the sand. And then there are people who have goals. Goals is a higher order than just tasks, but they have no purpose. So you have individuals that have all these goals, they achieve the goals, and then they're unhappy, and they become addicted to acquiring things. Then there are individuals who are purposeful living. They have a purposeful living. They know that they are here to magnify the cosmos in a way that only they can do it. They have goals and they do tasks. So within the purpose, they have a subset of goals and a subset of tasks. I'm going to assist people in finding their actual purpose. They'll still have goals and tasks, but the purpose will be pulling them to a higher level of actually living and expressing.
And I'm going to take people through a six-week journey of ever-expanding awareness with uh, spiritual practices, providing the context for insight and revelation to actually change their life. So they're not just getting a bunch of information that they can memorize, but we're actually moving through processes that they can begin to embody this information until it becomes real knowledge, real wisdom, and a real way of living. So in that very first week, they're going to begin to identify what structures of their life need to be changed. They're going to have an awareness of that. And we're going to begin to do processes around certain structures that allow them to really evolve that particular structure. Week two, we're going to go into the actual victim story that they carry. I shared earlier that victims carry a victim and blame story. It unconsciously runs us. When we become aware of that story, it loses its power and we're prone uh, to transformation. So in week three, what I'm going to do with you, we're going to come to a greater understanding of the manifestor consciousness. And I'm going to provide tools in which you will own your own personal affirmation that fits you. And we begin to create together your own best case scenario. So you, you're able to carry that on a regular basis, viscerally, in the body, in the emotional body, and in the mind. So that's going to be a very, very powerful week because we want to master that particular stage. When we get into week four, this is going to be really fun because I'm going to basically teach you how to shape shift, energetically shape shift. We're going to take areas of your life where there seems to be a lack of excellence, and we're going to take areas of your life where there seems to be excellence, and we're going to shape shift the energy. So the areas in which there's a lack of excellence or you want more excellence in, I'm going to teach you how to bring that vibration and frequency there. Now, I'm just giving you highlights here, but that's going to be very important. It's going to be a lot of fun, and you're going to be moving more into being a vehicle and a channel for the life energy and move more and more into the flow. Then we go into week five. Week five, I am going to do some meditative processes and some teaching around a greater understanding of being consciousness. We're going to begin to be aware of the sense of separation we carry unconsciously, and begin to break that down so that we're operating from a very dynamic sense of who we are in our real state of being. No separation, a state of being one with the presence. That's week five. And then I'm going to take you with me in week six into the full-on life visioning process. I'm going to go through the entire teaching of the technology. I'm going to establish a field for you to practice it. And then we're going to practice it together. And then we're going to harvest the insights that occur in the life visioning process. So what you're going to walk away with, you're going to walk away with a greater articulation of your life purpose. You're going to walk away with a feeling of what that feels like. You're going to walk away with a greater sense of willingness around what needs to happen within you in order for you to embody and express it. That's a very, very important week because we're going to take everything we learned in the five weeks and actually go into a deep level of practice so you can own it. The average person walking the planet right now are being pulled by societal fantasies. They're establishing goals that have nothing to do with their divine purpose. They're establishing goals are becoming unhappy, more and more unhappy with every goal achieved. What we're talking about now, what I'm teaching and what I want you all to participate in is to actually learn how to listen with the inner ear to your own soul that's always speaking. Your own soul is always guiding, always pulling, always directing you to a higher level of expression of your giftedness, your talent, your brilliance, your luminosity. And it's time now for you to begin to no longer listen to the world, no longer listen to parental fantasies, societal fantasies, but it's time to listen to your own heart. You have a heart's desire. Your heart's desire and the universal will is the same thing. Are you listening? I'm going to carry you into the vibration where you can listen to your own heart and then watch as your life changes from glory to greater glory, transforms with the grace and the dignity that you deserve. Well, first of all, as they begin to engage in spiritual practice and some of the practices that I'll give them, there's immediate results where the body temple is concerned. Immediately, tonic chemicals are produced and toxic chemicals are reduced. The chronic issues begin to dissolve a little bit longer, but their mindset will change immediately, their perception will change, then the experience begins to change. And then what I want to say is, what we're talking about here is developing a way of living so that you're always growing, always unfolding. We start with handling the issues of our life, and then we move into actually expressing 
more of our powerful talents and gifts and skills. Anyone can do this. The difficulty has been in our education system and in our society, we haven't been taught to come back to what's natural to us. And what's natural is our connection. What's natural is our ability to listen and hear. So it's not hard. All we need to do is be available. And I'm going to assist with individuals becoming more available to what they really want to do. They want this. They want to grow. They want to be happy. It's effortless if they're available, and I'm going to increase the availability quotient. Outside of the course itself, take a little bit of time every single day to practice. The time that you practice will build over months and years, but in the beginning, if you just give me just a little bit of time, 20, 30 minutes of your day, you'll see amazing results. And I must say that I've been doing this work for over 40 years, and the testimonies and the life-changing experiences that people have had, it still blows my mind. It still blows my mind. And I want all of you who are listening now to be a part of that family of having their lives changed by embracing a participation in their own unfoldment. You want this? Go for it. Thank you.